my lords, it's always very useful for me to follow the Lord Blencathra because it pushes up my adrenaline levels, which is obviously very good for speaking. So many thanks for that. And a thank you to the noble Earl, the Earl of Caithness, for bringing this and allowing us to air our concerns um, before the Brexit, negotiation, uh, before the Brexit um, legislation comes here to your Lordship's house. Other people have, have mentioned that we are at a crossroads now and it, it, it is incredibly important that the natural environment and animal welfare figure quite strongly in our minds as we go through the processes over the next few months. We're going to face a lot of choices on these issues and there is a lot of divergence, it's clear. So do we improve our environmental and animal protections and safeguard nature or do we burn them in a bonfire of red tape? to secure trade deal deals with the USA and Donald Trump? Or do we bring in tough new laws that recognise animals as sentient beings, deserving of legal protection? Or do we regulate so that we can swap our battery-caged eggs for their chlorinated chickens? We have educated consumers here. I think there will be an outcry if our food standards drop to any extent. And then, of course, there's the most important choice of all. Do we leave a healthy planet, an abundant, thriving natural world for our children, or do we continue to damage, devalue, and destroy the very living systems on which all of us depend for survival? The Noble Earl mentioned a loss of biodiversity, and here in Britain we've actually lost 50% of our wildlife since 1967, and of course that is in fact speeding up. We're losing more and more. There are stark choices we've got to make over the coming months, and we have to recognise that our decisions are going to have an impact downstream, i.e. in not just a few years' time, but in decades' time, and we will be held to account. Lord Teverson made the point about air pollution. I've been working on air pollution since 2000 and raised the issue then with the Mayor of London, with Ken Livingstone, with the second Mayor of London, Boris Johnson, and not very much was done, and now it's a crisis. So I would like to say Greens do look ahead we have policies that other political parties will pick up in 10 years' time or 20 years' time. And so perhaps take some advice now about the things that are going to be real crises in a decade or so. I cautiously welcome the commitments the government's made already about the direction of travel for environmental policy. They have committed to making this the first generation that leaves the natural world in a better condition than we inherited it. I find it quite difficult to read that without smiling. But the Secretary of State seems to have a genuinely held commitment to the environment, making pledges which Greens like me might once have been laughed at for being naive and idealistic. And I've heard him talk about things like reforming the CAP so that it addresses market failures and ensures that ecosystem services those essential things that nature provides for free and public goods are properly valued. And so we've got the opportunity to create a system which properly rewards sound environmental stewardship and punishes an industrial farming at all costs approach. We can create a system that does work for small farmers, that works for small holdings and lifestyle farmers as well as bigger farmers and allows small farmers to use the land to produce much more than just food to encourage biodiversity and improve the soil but it's early days and the so-called greenest government ever has quite a test ahead of it on its environmental principles the noble earl also mentioned that we all have a he closed with the, with the point that we all have a responsibility as individuals which is absolutely true of course but the government has to help us the government can make it easy for us to do the right things and the plastic bag tax is a classic example five pence has made all the difference to whether or not people use those plastic single-use plastic bags and i think the government has a real opportunity here to do similar things to, to, to uh, help us grow in the right way. You've also got to remember that most political parties think, think in terms of growth, of constant growth being an asset, a good thing. And of course, that's actually not true. It goes against all common sense. We have a finite planet. We have finite resources. We have to understand that when we put in place all of our legislation. And when the going gets tough, we cannot allow our government ministers to make grandiose policy pledges 
without any real delivery plan, which has happened so many times in the past. And then they scurry away when, when reality bites, and, and we don't see them again, and we can't hold them to account. The Secretary of State told me recently to judge him by his actions, not by his words. Well, I like his words so far, but I will judge his actions, and I'll judge him fairly, and if he doesn't live up to what he's saying, then I will judge him very harshly indeed. I'll, I'll be very happy if my caution is, is unnecessary, and I do hope that we can have a very good dialogue during the, the Brexit legislation when it comes here, and that the government will be in a listening mode and not just in a transmit mode. Uh, Lord Whitty raised the issue of, of, of the EU withdrawal bill. It is going to be a key battleground for many of us, and there will be a lot of amendments on the issues that we're discuss discussing today to retain a positive environment here in Britain and animal rules, that many of which are currently enforced by the EU. Things like maintaining the polluter pays principle is absolutely fundamental to this. And, of course, recognising animal sentience. There's news that there's going to be a statement on this. I look forward to hearing it. And, of course, we have to have those robust, independent enforcement mechanisms. It is simply not true that we have enough enforcement at the moment. I would say that once funding comes from the government, nothing is independent. And we really do need some sort of mechanism that enforces the law. It's going to be quite exciting here. I think a lot of the amendments on these issues are going to be forced to a vote. And <laughs> I think the government will lose some of them. Um, ministers will no doubt say that the withdrawal bill is not the place to raise these issues, that it doesn't fit in. And if not, then when is my question. And what the government could do is publish their plans for alternative legislation before the bill comes to this House. I feel that that would be a positive thing to do and it would help us um, to understand the direction of travel. I've read that MPs have been briefed by Gavin Barwell, Mrs May's Chief of Staff, that care for the environment is to be the unifying principle across a range of policies designed to rehabilitate the party's reputation. And that's absolutely wonderful. Um, if the government claims to care about, the, if the government claims that they care about our environment, are honest, then the issue of plastic. The, the noble earl did mention a very useful fact, which I will use in future and pretend it's my own, about the point at which the plastic is going to outweigh the number of fish in the sea. Um, uh, for example, a bottle, de a plastic bottle deposit scheme. That would be so, such a positive thing to do. And recycling rates are actually falling at the moment in the UK. They fell last year. So we are not the, the, the sort of the, the caring, responsible country that we often like to think that we are. These issues are far too important for us to leave to the whims of the government. So I challenge the government to set out its legislative plans for the environment and animal protection ahead of the withdrawal bill coming to the House, and I ask the Minister to make that commitment today. My Lord.